And good evening, everyone. I'm David Custer coming to you live tonight from downtown Midland. It looks like we are standing on the shores of the Titabawassee River, but actually we are on Ashman between Ann and Main Street. Take a look behind me right here. You see that green roof? That is the farmer's market, and right behind it you can see the top of the tridge. Now, the Titabawassee River has leveled off as of right now. We just received word from the National Weather Service that it crested at 35 feet. All afternoon, we were told that the level was 35 feet and rising. It was supposed to crest tonight between 8 or 9, but again, the National Weather Service says it has crested at 35 feet. Now, residents that live along or near the Titabawassee River, they are used to the flooding, but never have they seen anything like this. TV5's James Felton spoke with some of those folks. He joins us live now in Midland. James. Shortness of breath, just one of Marky's symptoms. He was constantly fatigued. He had headaches, digestive issues, hot flashes. He thought things would be better in just a couple of weeks, but that wasn't the case. And some of these symptoms still exist. One little boy became the face of the water crisis. Do you remember Sincere Smith? Well, Time Magazine put him on the cover of their magazine during the water crisis. Today, I sat down with him and his mom to get their reaction to the settlement. A chatty three-year-old had a lot to say after Time Magazine made him the poster child for the Flint water crisis in 2016. Are you proud of that magazine? Four years later, and now seven-year-old Sincere Smith is a little shy. But he still carries around that Time Magazine showing his innocent face damaged by the effects of the lead-tainted water. He just really just going through trying to get his skin toned to even out, so he goes to the derm dermatologist. Visible scars reminders of why mom Ariana moved her family out into the suburbs during the crisis, thinking it was the best thing for her family. But because she left the city, she lost the financial help she needed to take care of Sincere. We moved out of the city and lost like benefits, and then we had lost like their medical care, everything that they was covered under when we were in Flint. From the water crisis we had lost, so it was like we had to come back. And when she came back to Flint, Ariana tells me today, she quickly realized little had changed, including her own trust for the safety of the water. Our everyday life is still as it was in 2014, using bottled water for cooking, babies using bottled water, you know, people with skin using bottled water. Like, those type of things are still happening. I might save the money. Oh, you're going to save And while Ariana is appreciative that her family will receive a share of the $600 million settlement from the Flint water crisis lawsuit, she questions how you can put a dollar amount on human life. There's so many people who have died. Their families can't bring them back. Money can't bring them back. My daughter, dad died from Legionnaire's disease. It's things like money can't bring those people back. I don't care how much money they gonna give us. I'll, I'll still miss him. She'll still never know her dad. You know, people who have lost their family members, they can't get them back. It's no amount of money. That's just gonna be a okay amount. Now, Ariana tells me because of the water crisis, she has become an activist. She goes around the country encouraging people of color to vote. So a lot has changed for this family since Sincere was on the cover of this Time magazine. Now, again, a lot of details will be coming out once this settlement is finalized and becomes official. And you can count on TV5 to stay on top of that and we'll bring you every new detail as we learn it. For now, reporting live in Flint, outside the Flint water treatment plant, I'm David Custer. Meg, back to you. His father sits down with me to talk about the fallout and a local prosecutor is trying to get ahead of the problem in a story you'll see only on five. Um, you know, it's kids a parent conflicted this. over his son's mistake. I could have lost my son for up to 20 years for this incident. A school administrator with zero tolerance. You can't joke about violence. And a prosecutor spreading a threat of his own. You never ever want your name on the top of the arrest warrant. A now former Flushing High School student did in fact find his name at the top of an arrest warrant, charged with making a threat of terrorism, a felony that could lock someone up for a very long time. You know, that joke can be looked at 10 different ways. Yeah. Staring down a criminal defense attorney not expecting anybody else to ever see it. Was not what Jim Platt thought he'd be doing several hours a week, all because of something his teenage son said on Snapchat. It was just a horrific joke. It should have never been said. What was said, Platt describes as out of character for his son. The 16-year-old is an Eagle Scout. He loves to go fishing and be outdoors, even calling him a fun kid to be around. 
But in an online conversation with five other students last November, he threatened to do serious harm to the assistant principal. He was the only one of six that, from the Snapchat that they decided to put charges against. And part of that is because he said that he had access to gun, my guns. And so they had to take it very seriously. I got that. They wanted to have Mr. Platt surrender all of the firearms that were in his house because the threats were related to those firearms. You know, a number of kids talked to him after about legal stuff. Flushing principal Jason Melinchek says when a threat occurs... All threats are taken very seriously. We involve our, the local police. A student is immediately removed from school in order to undergo a risk assessment by a health provider. It may be weeks or months before someone, a professional, um, feels comfortable saying that this student is safe and not a threat to the school environment. In this case, the teen was expelled from Flushing High and won't be coming back. <laughs> But on this day, a powerful message is coming to the school, a message from the county's top defender of the law. You know when there's a kid who maybe is thinking about going down the wrong road. I want to go into the schools, tell the kids what the real problem is, tell them about the jeopardy they're putting themselves into. Ever since the Columbine High School massacre in 1999, Prosecutor David Layton says every threat has to be taken seriously. And when it does happen, a deep dive into a student's history takes place. Has he been a problem in the school before? Has he been getting in fights? Is he a bully? Is he doing his homework? I mean, all these factors into whether or not we're going to charge. And with severe consequences on the line, Layton's on a mission to get his message to as many students as he can. Talk to each other. There's nothing more important than that. It's not a joke. It's not funny. This is serious business. You're putting your liberty in jeopardy. You actually could get locked up. Potentially losing my son for 20 years? Yeah, nightmare. It's been hard on Platt, emotionally and physically. He had to take a leave of absence from work to help his son. The teen now goes to therapy and will finish his high school career online, no longer allowed to step foot in the school he once belonged to. That's the message going out to all these kids and even adults. If you wouldn't want your mother looking over your shoulder at what you're texting and putting into text, then you don't send it. All of the teen's charges have been reduced to misdemeanors to which he has agreed to plead guilty in family court. It's killing me and it's killing my sister that we can't be in there with her. She's in agony over not being next to her grandma battling COVID-19. It's a situation thousands of Americans are facing as loved ones battle the virus in isolation. And two mid-Michigan women have found a way to be close, but it's not for the faint of heart, and it's forcing them to battle Mother Nature. A reminder of life's unpredictability falling from the sky on a late April afternoon. The way we're feeling, I don't really feel the weather as much. I don't feel that I'm freezing. Fluffy white snowflakes and the frigid cold blowing in the wind. Do you have long johns on? Oh yeah, I've got everything on. Nothing like the daggers piercing the hearts of these two sisters. Two sisters huddled outside the window of their beloved grandma. A grandma they call Gigi. Hi Gigi, we love you. Julie and I are here, Gigi. Angie and I just want to be outside the window. And we want Gigi to know that her family's here and she's not alone. Gigi's on the inside, but her granddaughters, Angie and Julie, feel like they're the ones in lockdown, prisoners to the COVID-19 coronavirus that's invaded Gigi's fragile 98-year-old body. She will look at us and say, I have that virus. And we keep explaining to her that's why we're outside the window, Gigi. That is why we cannot come in and be with you. So every day, rain or shine, here's the hammer. Angie and Julie set up camp outside Gigi's window at her Mid Michigan nursing care facility. We want her to know that we are there for her and we love her and it's okay. For more than a month, Gigi's only interaction with her family, which includes 58 grandchildren and great-grandchildren, has been on the other side of this protective shield, all because of the invisible evil spreading in the world outside. Because she wanted to open the window, and I said, no, don't open the window. You're safe in there. You stay in there. You are safer than all of us. We're outside your window. You're not alone. 
We love you so much, Grandma. But that safety net broke apart when the virus found its way in, infecting Gigi and forcing her to leave her comfort zone, transferred to what's now known as the COVID wing. Once she started declining, we started writing messages more on the whiteboard. Messages they hope Gigi can read, because only days ago she could still pick up the phone when the girls showed up to her window. We tell her we love her. We tell her just relax and rest. We are just here for comfort. Gigi, a devout Catholic, surviving a stroke and hip surgery, and just like grandma, her granddaughters believe in the power of prayer and that Gigi's going to be around just a little bit longer. And we cry all the way home, and we pray every night that she does. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. If this was the end of her life, and she did not have COVID, we would be by her side. And we would be holding her hand and caressing her forehead, um, giving her kisses, because I don't want her to be alone. But deliver us from evil. Amen. So if she can pull through, that would be amazing. But I think she is um, getting ready to be with my grandpa. I think she's ready to go. And Angie's intuition was right. Gigi passed away last night with her granddaughters, Julie and Angie, right outside her window. I met with Harris for a one-on-one -on -one interview focusing on what she can do for Bid Michigan and the country if elected. It's an interview you'll see only on Five. Small businesses are hurting in Michigan. Many of them were closed for several weeks or three months. So how do you keep people safe but also keep our businesses open? Well, first of all, we have to get control of the pandemic and do it in a way that is about being smart. Fresh off her afternoon touring Flint businesses affected by the pandemic, vice presidential candidate Senator Kamala Harris met with me inside a small barber shop on Detroit's east side to talk about what she can do for mid-Michigan and why residents should take advantage of mail-in and early voting. Can Michiganders trust this process? Absolutely, Michiganders can trust this process and you know, listen, here's the thing. There's so much at stake in this election. And the thing that Joe and I want to just make sure is everyone knows that their voice is their vote. Their vote is their voice. We urge people to vote early. President Donald Trump has threatened to withhold money from Michigan, alleging attempted voter fraud over mail-in ballots. But just this week, he changed course, encouraging Michigan voters to vote early. We have some of the most diverse communities in mid-Michigan. And in 2016, for the first time, Saginaw County voters chose the Republican candidate, Donald Trump. This is the first time in three decades. So how do you plan to win those voters back? Joe and I plan on earning the vote of everyone. And it's going to be by pointing out that on this issue of COVID-19 and this pandemic, um, where there have been thousands of Michiganders that have died from it, hundreds, over 100,000 who have contracted the virus, that Joe and I will grab this bull by its horns and, and do a number of things, including having a national testing strategy. But extensive plans to battle COVID-19 come with a hefty price tag. America's debt is in the trillions right now, and the pandemic is only making the debt worse. How will you get control without cutting programs like Medicare or Social Security? Well, on day one, we need to get rid of, and we will, that tax cut that Donald Trump passed for the richest 1% of our country and the biggest corporations of our country, which has contributed at least $1 trillion to the deficit. We dealt with two catastrophic disasters in mid-Michigan within the last five years. We had the Flint water crisis, and then we had the dam failures uh, this year. So how do you fix the infrastructure issues that are plaguing so many American cities like ours and impacting these lives? Joe and I have a plan for $2 trillion that will be invested in America's infrastructure. And so when we look at places like Flint, when we look at Detroit, when we look at the rest of the country, and also making sure that 40% of that money is directed at the hardest hit and the most in need communities. And Flint, of course, is on that list. And on top of Senator Harris's list, to stop the hatred and violence sweeping across the country. Between race concerns and political issues, it does not feel like we are the United States of America right now. So if elected, how will you unite the country? By bringing everyone together. It's such a shame what has happened over these last almost four years. We've had a president in Donald Trump who has spent full time trying to sow hate and division, turning Americans against each other. It's awful. 
I asked whether Trump should nominate a successor to Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. She said it should be left up to the voters and whomever they choose to be president.